thoughts of our people in the Japanese service are in Okayama today. They just headed out after the Japanese service and they're at a Christian, they're at a Assemblies of God uh, conference. And so they took our sound equipment with them. So I don't have my wireless mic, lapel mic, so I have to use a regular mic. But everybody can hear me, okay? Yeah, okay. Hope that stays. You get the old fashioned, uh, just a regular handheld. We are in uh, September, the ninth month, and uh, throughout this year I've been preaching on the book of Exodus as we've been looking at the life of Moses and his work, his teachings. And we are at the point where we are at the Ten Commandments. This is part three of a series that I've been doing on the Ten Commandments. In truth, we could spend the entire year, ten years, on the Ten Commandments. That's how uh, deep and uh, useful that they are. But <clears throat> uh, that's not our focus this year, and so we're only spending three weeks on the Ten Commandments, the Aserat Hadibrot, as they are known. The Ten Commandments are actually not commandments as translated in Hebrew they're called the ten statements or the ten things or the ten principles and so uh, you can call them commandments but really they're principles that God has handed down to man for living his life and it's not commandments in the sense that we ought to do these things or we ought not to do these things but they are principles in the sense that to do these things or to live by them makes life not just easier but better and it's the way God intended for life to be lived it's like gravity you know you have the laws of gravity and it's not like you can choose to live by gravity or not live by gravity Gravity is gravity, and there's, it's a principle that all of us live by, and the more we acknowledge gravity in our lives, the better and easier life will be. And that's uh, what God has given us in the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> Excuse me, my voice is a bit weak right now because I just spent an hour singing and uh, praying, so uh, it's going to be a little bit weak. But I can still say amen, so... We're in Exodus chapter 20, and we're in the last part of the Ten Commandments. Uh, last a couple weeks ago, my last sermon was on the first five commandments, God's top five. And so we're looking at the last five commandments, six through ten. And uh, go ahead and read that together. <clears throat> We're going to read chapter 20, verses 13 through 17. I've got it up on the screen for you, but you brought your own Bibles. Oh, thank you. If you've brought your own Bibles, I encourage you to open up in there, take your notes, make your markings. Uh, but it's also in the pew Bibles in front of you, but also here as well. As is our custom, I'd like for us to read it together. So we're going to read. It's a short, short passage today. You shall not murder. Shall we begin? You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Please continue. You shall not steal. You shall not give false witness against your neighbor. You shall not commit your neighbor's cause. You shall not cover your neighbor's wife as well as a man's servant or maid servant. His ox or not be for anything that belongs to your neighbor. Amen. 
This is the second half of the Ten Commandments. And I wanted to also give you a couple more scriptures. You don't have to read them uh, out loud. I'll read them for you, but shed a very important light on what we have today. Uh, as I mentioned before, in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was asked, Rabbi, what is the greatest command? And Jesus gave a very astute answer saying that love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest command. And he was quoting Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6. And then he quotes a different scripture for the second commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So Jesus is saying that you could summarize the Ten Commandments and even all of the rest of the law into two statements. One is, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And that's the first five commandments, is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Our vertical relationships um, are characterized by love. And he says the second set of commandments, the last five, six through ten, could be summarized in love your neighbor as yourself, our horizontal relationships. <clears throat> and he says that basically all of the do nots can be summarized with love your neighbor. And Paul also repeats that uh, and explains it a little bit more in Romans chapter 13. He says, let no doubt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever commandments there may be are summed up in this one rule. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does not harm, love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And that's a key word. Let's repeat that. Please repeat after me. Fulfillment. 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 Let's keep that in the back of our minds. That's a very important word. And both Paul and Jesus were quoting Leviticus chapter 19 when they said, love your neighbor. And um, that's a very important uh, verse in Scripture. Uh, it says, do not seek revenge or bear a grudge against one of your people, but love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And so God is saying, all of these rules that we have, that I have laid out for you in, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, all of that which deal with other people, the civil law, you know, don't... Uh, murder and, and don't even uh, think about murder and, and, and don't uh, when act with other people you're going to be subject to this kind of judgment if you break a certain uh, law uh, that's known as the civil law the civil law and what goes beyond the civil law because the civil law ends with Israel is what's known as the moral law and that's what we have in the Ten Commandments the moral law and the moral law could be summed up as love your neighbor as yourself and so what we have in the Ten Commandments is the true meaning of love if you were to ask Jesus what is the meaning of love he would point you to the Ten Commandments because it says love your neighbor as yourself. And so I kind of paraphrase it here. Do not murder means basically love forgives. True love forgives. Do not commit adultery means that true love is faithful. Do not steal means that true love respects boundaries and it respects others' property. Do not lie means that true love does not deceive. And do not covet means that true love 
rejoices in others' blessings. This is the true meaning of love. <clears throat> and I thought about that. I go, well, Jesus, if, if basically all it means is, is to love my neighbor as myself, why didn't you just say that? Why do we have to go through all of these do not, do not, do not, you shall not, don't do this, don't do that? Why are there so many commandments and so many rules? In Leviticus 19, if you look that up, the list is even longer of do nots and do this and do that. And wh God, why don't you just tell us, love each other as ourselves? Isn't that more simple? And I just thought, well, um, if any of you have ever worked with children, taught a class or, or um, babysat even, and you had two or three kids or even a group of kids, a class, and you were to leave the room for 10 minutes, and you just, before you left the room, you, you said, okay, I'm, I'm leaving for 10 minutes. Be good. <laughs> and then you left the room, and you come back 10 minutes later, <laughs> is there a room left, right? Maybe it's burned down, or you know, there's writing on the wall, and maybe there's a few kids dead. Who knows, right? Because be good, what does that mean? You can't really expect kids to just say, be good, okay, and, and that's it. And I think that's what God is saying with the Ten Commandments, and with the whole law, that He says, look, love one another, and let me tell you what love means. Here you are. And so we have the law. But the Bible teaches us that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. The Bible, from the Old Testament to the New Testament, makes clear that fulfillment of the law is found in the death and in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He is the fulfillment of the law. And so what do I mean, or what does he mean by fulfillment? Well, uh, you know, if you have anything in your apartment, if you live in a regular modern day apartment, you have a refrigerator, you have electrical appliances like a refrigerator, a TV, a microwave, a stereo, uh, electrical fan, a cell phone, an air conditioner. I hope you have an air conditioner. <clears throat> you have all these things that are designed and are supposed to be used for your benefit, to make life better, to make life easier. And that's why you have them. However, they are useless. They are just a bunch of boxes, plastic boxes that take up space if they don't have an electrical plug. And let me teach you some useful English for the Japanese people. It's electrical plug. It's called an electrical plug. You can repeat after me. Electrical plug. Electrical. Yeah, the, the plug. Don't, if you're not Japanese, you don't have to say that. It's, it's like, it's just the Japanese people. But um, now for the foreigners here, uh, the way you say this is consento. Yeah, consento. Very useful word. Okay, consento. And I, I went like two years here in Japan without knowing that it, without is, and I'm like, electrical pragu, pragu, pragu. People are like, I don't know what you're talking about. So it's consento, consento. Okay. And without your electrical plug or without your consento, none of those plastic boxes will be of any use to you. They just take up space. And so what you can see is that the electrical plug is the fulfillment of all of these electrical appliances. Without the electrical plug, they don't work. And Jesus says that he did not come to throw away the law, to abolish the law. He came to fulfill the law. The Ten Commandments, the moral law given to us by God on Mount Sinai, is made, is given to us for our benefit, for our usefulness, to make life better for us. But it doesn't work without Jesus Christ because He is the fulfillment of the law. How? How does that work? How does He... Oh, go back there. Messed up there. How does the, uh, He fulfill our law? Well, you know, if we are honest... If we are truly honest with ourselves, 
we would admit that none of us have been able to obey this law. If we are truly honest with God, we would admit that there is no one here that has perfectly kept all of these laws. If we are truly honest with ourselves and with each other, we would have to admit that we have broken every one of these commandments at one time or another. You say, what? How, how does that work? I mean, Chris, I mean, I'm not a murderer. I've never killed somebody. How have I, how, how have I broken that law? Or I've, I'm not an adulterer. I've never committed adultery. How could I have broken that law? And what Jesus says in, in chapter 5 of Matthew, he says, look, it's not the written word that you broke. It's the spirit of the written word. It's the matter of the heart. These commandments are not just commandments, but they are principles. And it's the principle that you have broken. It's the principle that you have trespassed upon. Let me illustrate by that what that means. There's a, a, a Japanese saying. Uh, it's called Bozu Niku Kerya. Kesama de Nikui. So I want the, the foreigners here to, to say it with me and do your best with pronunciation because I'm not helping right now. Bozu Niku Kerya. Kesama de Nikui. Let's try one more time. Ready? Go. Bozu Niku Kerya. Kesama de Nikui. All right. Now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to explain this and Japanese people correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> okay. But Bozu is a Japanese Buddhist monk. And Bozu basically means uh, shaved head. Okay, Bozu. And uh, Niku means uh, to hate, to dislike. And so if you hate a monk, Kesa means uh, his, his cloth, his robe. And so if you hate, basically it's saying if you hate a monk, even his robes are what you despise or make you mad. And that expression is to say that, look, if you're mad at, you know, your husband or your wife or maybe, you know, your coworker because, you know, you don't like the way that they, they make noises on the table or you don't like the way that they um, leave the toilet seat up or down or you don't like, you know, a certain way they, they talk or, or something about that. It's not that you're, you don't like that thing about them. It's you don't like them. <laughs> It's the person that you have a problem with. It is not the cloth or the outside thing. It's a matter of the heart. And Jesus says this, look, you've heard it said that you should not murder. And if you murder, you're subject to judgment. But let me tell you, is what Jesus says, if you hate a brother in your heart, you are subject to judgment. You've broken this law. And not only that, if, if you tell your brother, or you tell somebody, you idiot, you fool, you worthless piece of junk, who, who, what do you think you're doing? If you even say that, you've broken this law. You're guilty of committing murder. And not only that, if you tell somebody, you know, you don't deserve anything good to happen in your life. If you've thought that, if you even said it, if you can accuse somebody of being a fool and verbalized it, you've, bro you've broken the sixth commandment because it's a matter of the heart. And he, s he goes on to say, and you know what? You've heard it said that you cannot, you should not, or you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you, and this is Jesus speaking, he says, even if you look at a woman with adultery in your heart, you are guilty. You have broken the seventh commandment. Why? Because it's not the action that God is concerned about. It is a matter of the heart. And that's the principle that he has. Lying, stealing. Are we honest with ourselves? Oh, but it's only a little white lie. It's just, it didn't really hurt anybody, you know, and I was trying to help somebody out when I said that. It, you know, it was, it was nothing. If we're truly honest with God, a sin is a sin. And God says in Romans 3, 
look, if you were truly honest with me and truly honest with yourself, you would admit that there was no one, especially you, who was righteous. Not even one. There is no one who deserves life. Oh my goodness. Chris, what, what are you trying to do? Make me feel guilty? Make me feel bad about myself? No, I'm not. I'm not trying to feel, make you feel bad about yourself. Although you should. <laughs> That's what preachers do. But uh, it's not to make you feel guilty. It's to let you know that you are guilty. Because the purpose of the Ten Commandments is to make our lives better, but it doesn't work without Jesus Christ. Because it is to lead us to the truth that no one stands innocent under God's perfect standard. You've got to admit that no matter how good you may think you are, you have broken His commandment. And therefore, you deserve punishment. That is the law of God. But this is where Christ comes in. That's where the death of Christ comes into effect. His death on the cross is the payment of our penalty for breaking these commandments. And not only that, but... Oh, yeah. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I love, that's like my favorite verse right there. Because it tells me that, oh my goodness, even though I've broken these laws once, twice, a hundred times, because of Christ, the punishment was taken. My punishment was taken for me by Christ Himself. And that's by His death. But let me tell you what happens after His death. He died for my punishment, for my sins. And then, three days later, He rose to life. And so what does that do? That makes the Ten Commandments useful for me. That spirit, that power that rose Jesus Christ from the, the grave. It's the same spirit now that is living in me. And it's by that spirit that I can take these commandments of do not murder, do not hate, do not commit adultery, do not lust. And I can now have the power to follow them. It says there, and if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Now, where I couldn't forgive because of the hatred in my heart, I can now forgive because I have the power from the resurrected Spirit of Christ living in me. And I am able to follow that sixth commandment. And before where I couldn't uh, you know, stop committing adultery every time I looked at a woman. Now I have the strength to stay pure and faithful by the resurrection spirit, by the resurrection power of Christ. And, you know, where before I, I couldn't stop myself from taking things that didn't belong to me, or I couldn't keep myself from deceiving others. Now I have the power to control myself because of Christ's Spirit living in me. Where before, there was nothing in my life that could satisfy me. No matter how much I bought, no matter how many things I filled my apartment with, no matter how many boyfriends or girlfriends I had, no matter how many friends I made, there was an emptiness in my heart that could not be filled. Now, because of Christ's Spirit living in me, I can be content. I have no need to covet or desire or to be jealous of what another person has. That's the beauty. That's the awesome, life-changing power of the resurrected Spirit of Christ. Amen? Amen. This is the true meaning of love. Now, I've already shared with you uh, in my past sermons how Christ's resurrection power gave me the ability to forgive and then to honor my, my parents, my mother and my father. But let me give you a couple more examples. This, the seventh uh, 
uh, excuse me, the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. <clears throat> I, uh, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> we are in our apartment, we ran out of uh, paper. And I print, I print my sermons on used paper, um, just the back of used paper um, in our apartment. And we ran out of, of paper. So what, what I thought I could do was, oh, okay, well, you know, my office has tons of, of used paper. We have lots of paper, you know, that we don't use, and we put it in a recycle box, and <clears throat> we have just stacks of it, and it doesn't get used. I'll just take it home and use it for my sermons. And this, this was a few weeks ago, so I was preparing for, for these sermons, and I was thinking about the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. <laughs> and I was take, taking these papers home, and the only thing I could think about was the Eighth Commandment, do not steal. And I thought, Lord, I'm not stealing. I, this is, you know, work paper, and, and this is going to be used for, you know, sermons. Do not steal. <laughs> so I was like, oh, man, God, but, but God, you know, where am I going to Paper is expensive. It's ridiculous. I go to Dale Dale and buy new paper just so I could print my sermon and throw it away after I'm done with it. Come on. God, let's be, you know, let's be reasonable. Do not steal. <sighs> so this is what I did. I brought the paper back. I took the paper back to the office, and uh, I, I got our, our, our Deo Deo card. We have a Deo Deo credit card, and so whenever we make purchases, we get points, right? And I took that Deo Deo card and I went to Deo Deo for some computer paper. And it turns out, I was able to get paper for free. <laughs> wow, I don't have to steal. Now you could be saying, oh Chris, come on, that's ridiculous. That, that has nothing to do with God. That's just you being a consumer in the 20th century, come on. No, I believe in God. I believe that His will, His way, directs every single detail of my life. And his command, do not steal, is something that I can follow. I can because of Christ's power living in me. And when I decide to obey him, even in the little things, I'm rewarded with free paper. Praise God. And then there's the commandment, do not covet. Do not covet the 10th commandment. And, it's, and God is saying, look, it's, it's not about wanting all these things all around you. It's about being content with what I have given to you. It's about contentment. And, you know, I was struggling a few months ago thinking, oh God, we've got a son coming on the way. A new baby. And we live in such an old apartment. And it's so small. And the rent is not going to get lower and I don't know if my job is going to get any better I'm not gonna get a better salary and I don't know if I should get a master's degree and, and you know try to improve my career and all this and uh, should I negotiate a new contract with my boss and what do I do about this and my friend I called up my friend he had a birthday and you know, he's in the States and his wife he takes his wife takes care of all of the finances you know for them and you know what his wife did for him on his birthday she bought him a car a new car on his birthday and so when I was talking to him and he said yeah I, you know Rachel just bought me a new car I just thought Jim I just broke the Tenth Commandment do not covet that's just terrible thank you for making me sin <laughs> yeah. But as I thought about this more, and I was preparing for this the sermon, I, I, I heard another sermon on the tenth commandment. He says it's about being content. And here's the secret. Here's the secret. Paul in Philippians chapter uh, four, he says, "Look, I have learned the secret of being content in every situation." And what's the secret? It's right there in the verse. It says he learned. He learned it. Contentment is not natural for man. And that's why God gave it to us in the 10th commandment. You have to learn to be content, to be assured that, Chris, wherever I have you, in whatever job, in whatever apartment, in whatever car or non-car, 
that's exactly where I want you to be. And you can be content in that. Why? Because I'm in your life. Because Christ's Spirit is living in you. You can be content. You can rest. And you don't have to want Jim's car. You don't have to want uh, another person's job. You don't have to want another person's education. When you need it, and when the time is right for you, and you and your family are in need, I will provide for you in every way, in the best way. So, why covet? Why? It's not necessary. Be content. I was reminded of a psalm by Asaph, uh, Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but you? And the earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I don't need to covet because I have the love of God. That is the true meaning of love. Now I could go on and on of examples from my life of breaking, you know, these commandments and I don't need to go into this, the seventh or the ninth commandment uh, because one, you don't need to hear it and two, uh, the point I'm trying to make is that without the power of Christ working in my life, I am no good in keeping these commandments. Without the resurrection power in my life, I'm nothing but a man who is just trying to follow rules, and I'm frustrated in my inability to keep them. And the Ten Commandments are just this reminder constantly that I am a lawbreaker. And that is without the power of Christ. But since the Spirit of Christ is in me, the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is giving me new life, is giving life to my mortal body. I am a new creation. And these Ten Commandments are not reminders of my failures, but these Ten Commandments are now a light unto my feet, and they are a lamp unto my path. They lead me and they guide me. They are the principles that make my life so much better. The Ten Commandments teach me how to love God with all my heart, soul, and mind. And they teach me how to love my neighbor as myself. The true meaning of love. And that's the role and the purpose of the Ten Commandments for a Christian. For a non-Christian, they are to show you the true standard of God. And if you understand that you are breaking the law of God that's, in his, in, that's written on your heart, you need to repent and you need to come to Jesus Christ and receive His power. Chapter 20, where we find the Ten Commandments. And from 20 to 23, it's just more and more commandments that God gives to Israel. And then from 25 to 31, there's more more commandments that God gives to Israel. So we're going to skip those parts. I'm going to save that for a sermon series maybe sometime in the future. And next week, we're going to pick up in chapter 32 of Exodus and move on with our study there. But I'd like to ask <clears throat> uh, Ian uh, to come on back up, and we're going to prepare for our closing song as we sing together. But as we get ready for that, shall we pray? Heavenly Father, uh, we are gathered here, Lord, finishing up our time. But Father, uh, may your word give us guidance, give us leading, and give us hope again in what you can do and what you want to do in our life. Lord, help us to love our neighbor as ourself, as you have taught us. And for this we will thank you. In Christ's name, amen. Shall we all rise as we sing our closing song? Oh, we're going to sing uh, How Great Is Our God. So, okay.